All right. Uh, all right. So I guess I'll welcome the live audience then, since it appears that I am live. Uh, welcome to the Pow uh, Portland PowerShell user group. Uh, we're glad to have everybody here, both in person and online. Uh, before I get too deep into it, I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank uh, Sapien Software uh, for really being with us from the beginning and for uh, generously providing all of the food that we have here locally. Um, they can't sponsor your food online, unfortunately, but uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll talk to them about it. <laughs> uh, and I want to thank Viewpoint Construction Software for providing the venue uh, and for providing the uh, refreshments. They've been great to us uh, with the venue, so we, uh, we very much appreciate that. We'll have a link to both of those in the uh, description. Uh, later on, for the local group, we'll, you know, we'll have our networking and we'll have our um, uh, you know, PowerShell wins and news discussions you know, at the end. But for right now, for all of the online audience, uh, we're going to have Kevin Marquette who's going to be talking to us about uh, hash tables. We're gonna have a really detailed deep dive into, into hash tables and it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be really great. So I'll, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Kevin handle his, uh, his own introduction. Um, so uh, just thanks for uh, being here and uh, take it away. All right, well, thank you very much. So I'm a, I run the Southern California PowerShell user group. Um, yeah, I'm a MVP now and uh, as the, what, 2018 PowerShell hero. So I've been trying to do what I can for the community. And one of the way I like, ways I like to give back is, you know, through these the other user groups. So today we're going to dive deep into hash tables. And if you haven't seen my post on it yet, I highly recommend it. Um, so from my website, and I link this into the chat window, I have literally everything I can think of about hash tables. I pretty much put this in here about two years ago. I know I might have a couple new details tonight as I go through the material that I probably ought to go back and put in here because I do try to maintain my old, old pages. So just looking through the index here, this kind of scrolls on forever. You know, there's probably um, just pages and pages of information on just hash tables here. And then for tonight's presentation, there is, oh, let me fire up something real quick. Uh, out on GitHub, I actually have this entire presentation sitting um, as, as, as I'm presenting it. Um, so you can download the zip package or uh, follow along locally if you so choose. And so I'm missing a zoom it here. All right. So, yeah, so here's my link, uh, Kevin Marquette slash hash table presentation, and all of the code for tonight will be there. So I kind of have a lot to cover, so I'm just gonna like jump into it and see how far we get. Um, so then my con contact information, uh, you know, at Kevin Marquette on Twitter, and uh, let's right now. Oh, let me kill one more, couple more plugins here. Uh, let's get. Sorry, I have just a couple plugins that are beautiful, except when I'm presenting. Let me just deal with the workspace. All right, so let's jump into the basics. Um, I always like to just touch on just the visual of array syntax, just so that when we start looking at hash tables, you kind of start noticing the differences. So when defining an array, right, we use these parentheses with, you know, strings of numbers, and we can access them individually uh, by accessing the zeroth element, the first index, or the one, uh, so. All right, there we go. So now when I run these individual ones to access by the numerical value, um, I get the values out that were, that were stored in there. We can enumerate them just by going over the pipeline. And you know this here represents the item, each item in the array. We can assign values just by using the equal sign. And here we can see that as I check on this one value down below, that you know we get the value out that I place into it. 
And then we can do arrays on multiple lines uh, using the same syntax, just, just, just setting it out straight. So let's say this loaded. Again, I can access in the zeroth element or the element number two. So this leads us like right into hash tables themselves. And what actually prompted me to write this article initially was that I came from like C sharp into PowerShell. And for whatever reason, I never made the connection between the hash tables and dictionary collections I was using in those other languages to the way PowerShell used and leveraged um, hash tables. So technically, a hash table is really just a data structure that lets us store information into it. And it generally uses key value pairs. So we're going to use keys to store values and use those same keys to get them back out. And because it's such a common element of PowerShell, we get to use these uh, braces instead of parentheses to define an empty new hash table. So I'm going to create this age hash table. And I'm going to show you the ugly syntax first, where I grab a key and a value using uh, Kevin and 37 as a number. And then if I, and this is, this is really an object, this hash table is. So I can call this add function to say for this key, set this value. And if I spot check my age list to see what I have, I'll see my name and my age in the list. And I can add other items just the same way. When I look at it, I'll have an array list that holds both. So it's like the name is the key, which gets me to the value. Um, we can access via this item object, but you're probably more commonly known uh, to use this the same bracket accessor, very similar to the array. But in this case, we use our keys. So here, if I ask what Kevin's age is, I get just the value stored with that key. And same for the next one. Um, and then we can also leverage these braces to update values in the key. So just like I was using that add met method before, here, let me clear out my, my, my age list. So by defining a new one, I basically wipe out anything I had before, right? I create my new key value pair, and then I assign the value into the hash table using the key. And when I take a peek at him, I see the same thing we had before. And then here's me adding a second item. So that's the bare basics. Um, we can create these values on the fly. So we have this syntax here where I can say, here's the key and the value. So you can actually define lots of things at once. Um, so when you initialize it, you get all of those values into your hash table. Um, and then we can treat it as like a lookup table. So here's a sample where, let's say I've got several environments, prod, QA, dev, and there's a different server in each one. So the idea is, you know, I, I create these values so that my environments list all of those when I check on it. Oh, make sure I hit the right button. There we go. So these servers and these values. Then if I specify an index lookup of, say, QA, I could then reach into this hash table and ask for what's the server in the, in the QA environment. And like you might do something similar with, say, a switch statement, right? Where you might say, you know, this environment would be the switch value coming in. And depending on which value, you could jump to a different server setting. And this is just a compact way of doing that same type of logic if all you're doing is finding, translating one value to another. So yeah, this is how you use it as a lookup table. Um, one clever feature that I can't say I've used much is that you can actually specify multiple keys. And when I execute it, I'll actually get back multiple values. So I can see down here when I ran this, um, 
Oh, didn't quite. Oh, my screen's clipping there. Um, but I'm actually getting, you know, my dev box and my QA box because I actually specified both of them here. And this will take uh, an array, or I'm uh, sorry, an array as the variable. So it will enumerate the array to walk the list of values to pull out the servers that match. Like I said, it's clever. I haven't used it really much in production, but um, it's interesting to know. The another unique property of hash tables is that if you're if you use an invalid value, something that doesn't exist, it's actually just going to give you null. So in this case, this value equals null is true because I don't actually have a missing environment um, value in my hash table. Now, the one caveat here is if you by chance use strict mode um, for your scripts, it will actually throw an error for you if you're trying to access um, uh, an item that doesn't exist in your hash table. So let me clear my my list here and let's walk a hash table. Let's walk over all the key value pairs. So as I take a look at this this list, um, at face value, like this guy is just an object and the hack I did here is I measured how many objects I had, and this told me I only had one of these. So that's why this feels like it lies to me, and it only told me there's one item here. But the hash table itself will have his own count property to tell you how many items are inside of it. So, so the point thing noted here is when I piped this object, I got one object down the pipeline. So if we're going to get the values out of it, we're going to have to do something just a little bit special. If I take a look at the array list, uh, we got several properties and methods. Um, you know, our, our keys and values will give us all the keys and values. There's our count property we just looked at. And there are a handful of methods that I might, I'll touch on a couple of these as we go along. So the values give us everything that's inside of it, 37 and 9, those are the ages. And if I need the keys, I can get just the keys. So let's do our first enumeration. So in this, this, this approach, I'm going to give me a list of keys and for each over each of them. So we're going to walk the list of keys. So as I run this guy, it's basically going to pipe our, our key into this list, and I'm using PS item here, but just so you know, I could have used our dollar underbar. So these are equivalent. And then I'm reaching into and accessing our hash table using that key to get our value. So my sentence is on the below, it says below, it says I'm 37 and Alex, my son, is, is nine. Uh, we can do a traditional for each loop where we basically walk the keys in the key list and do the exact same trick where we index into and enumerate all the values. Uh, there is such thing as an enumerator, like a, a special object used when walking collections, and hash tables support those. So if I check this enumerator, um, the get enumerator will give me a key and a value to access the current key and the current value as it walks the list. And if I measure this guy, oh, that kind of flew by. Let me adjust my screen again. It knows that there's two items to enumerate over. So in practice, when I use this, I can do a get enumerator for the pipeline. And when I use an enumerator, my object has a key and my object has a value. So depending on this approach you like, the syntax, like you can either use your, your PS items to reach in and access the, the values, or you can actually walk the list of objects effectively, or the, the, the pairs of key value pairs, and, and just directly reference them.
And the same exact thing uh, works for our for each statement. So we can do numerator.key or numerator.value in this case. Um, like I said, lots of objects have enumerators. So while it might make sense that you could walk the keys for, say, a hash table, there's other data structures for storing data in computer science, like stacks and queues and linked lists, where you might leverage enumerators quite heavily. But in PowerShell in general, we just use the pipeline for everything. And this is one, and the hash table is one of the few objects that we find lots of value in using an enumerator like this. So bad enumeration. So let me create some errors here. What I'm going to do is, let's say I want to update or make changes to this hash table on the fly. So let me clear up a new hash table here with my environment servers. And for some reason, um, I want to put some test data in here. I want to overwrite all my servers with this value, server dev03. And at face value, this looks like it should work. But the reality is I'm trying to modify a hash table while we are enumerating the hash table. And we actually get this error uh, that says an error occurred while enumerating through a collection. It was modified. So apparently, that's a big no-no. We can't make a change like this while we're enumerating it. And it doesn't matter if you do the for each, because we're still walking this, this, has, this hash table, and we can't modify it as we're, as we're walking it. So one of the ways I get around that scenario is actually I clone the keys. So keys.clone will give me a copy of the keys, and then I actually enumerate that list instead. So if I do keys.clone, I get the values prod, dev, and QA. And now when I do my for each object, so let me see what's in here first, just to see the values change. All right? I see my full servers. I do my loop and check my value again. And we'll see that we overwrote all those values on the fly without getting that, that error. And I'd use the same trick in the for each statement, um, for each keys.clone. So, so far, all of my examples have treated hash tables probably more in the classical sense of here's a key to give me a specific value. And generally, all my examples had the value meaning the same thing. Like this was a hash table of ages indexed by person's name. Um, another way, a different school of thought, or a way to look at hash tables as more of a collection of properties, where we might say, like in this example, all right, is, uh, did I jump ahead a little bit? I, I did a little bit. So you can use properties as of saying like, this is the person's name and here's a string and here's the person's age and here's the value. And we also get the ability to do dot property accessing. So you can treat it very much like an object. It's a very cheap fake object that you can use in many cases without building a full blown object. And so let me fire this guy up here just to see our object. So now when I run and see what this person looks like. They are separate, you know, age and name are, are separate, separate indexes. And using these dot properties, oh, scroll happy there. These dot properties, we can assign values on the fly. Um, so if I want to set the city as Irvine or set the state as California, if I check it now, I should have four properties in play that are holding different values. So in a way, this person could be like this, this entity that it has all the state of that person object, and you might have multiple persons. Um, so checking for keys and values. Now, one thing you can do is, I've seen this logic a lot, where you, if you just, you do an if on a value, and as long as the value is not null 
or zero, you'll get a return true. So if this person has an age, it'll execute this statement. This is okay when you know what your data types are. Um, sometimes when you're doing more dynamic type coding, it might be more unknown if, if you're like walking properties and seeing if they exist, that you can have any value in here. And sometimes a property not existing means something. So I generally, when I actually have a property, I pretty much always test it, sorry, test it against null. And more appropriately, I actually test null against the age. And I, I flip and I use this approach in all my code because there's some corner cases where this statement here lies to you and doesn't give you the result you expect. A little bite me enough times that I've just given up ever trying to use this syntax and always put null on the left side. And the very quick example is if is when you have um, a collection or an array that it actually contains a null or or contains or contains values, and that can that's it's an edge case, but it's enough that I, I that's into account for it. And if you don't want to do the null check, you can actually ask if the person or maybe null is a possible valid value, you can actually do the contains or contains key on that property to see if that's something that actually exists or not in that hash table. Um, and then the hash table actually allows us to remove keys. So if I decided that we didn't want to present this person's age, we could execute the remove and my person is one that has one less property now. Um, and then clearing keys, if you just want to like flush everything out or start over, uh, one approach is just to initialize a new hash table. So if I specify a blank hash table, my person now is effectively empty. But if you don't want to create a new object, but instead flush out the existing object that you have, um, you can use clear and it'll actually remove all the values in it. I will, I might loop back if I have time at the end to talk, to talk about like shallow copies and what that means. And that's a scenario where you might want to clear the object if multiple people are using it or multiple pieces of your code are using it versus just overriding your local reference. So when we run this guy, it would still be the same object, but now that he's clear, there's, there's nothing in there. All right, so now we jump over to kind of like my next wave of more of the fun stuff, I guess. Um, ordered hash tables. So I didn't mention this before, but a hash table is by is a collection that doesn't have any order to it. So as you add stuff to it, well, sometimes stuff, actually you can even see in my previous example, right? My name was one of the first things that I added, but he's actually showing up in like the middle of my list here. So if you actually care about the order of your hash table, you can actually specify it, specify it as an ordered hash table by using this, I don't know, type accelerator, uh, when you initialize the array. Now, it is faster if you don't order it. Like there is a small cost to ordering. So if you don't need it ordered, don't go through the work and overhead of ordering it. But if it's something you need when you're doing like uh, reporting or some other cases where order is important, um, it's still an option. If we ever want to do a hash table in line, we put a semicolon between the values to do everything on a single line. And it doesn't care if you have a trailing semicolon or not. Just like a little syntactic sugar. And the most common place I see this is when, uh, is when people are doing like say a select object and they want to do like a custom, um, a custom expression. So here's a case where let me just execute this to get some data. Where my drives 
um, has all these values, but I want to know. Uh, let me run this guy's view. Sorry, my mouse is so jumpy here. Just run this guy. But if I want to do like the total space in gigabytes that are free, in this case, I gave it a name. This is short for name. And the E is short for expression. Expression. And in there, I gave it a script block for my expression that basically takes the use space plus the free space and divides it by a gigabyte. And this is a way to do a very on the custom select using a hash table, this syntax down below that reports it more like the way I'd want to see it. So I think before, the total space free was presented in free gigabytes, use gigabytes, and total space. So it wouldn't show me the space that was used. Um, but anyway, and this is what many people, when they're learning PowerShell and about one-liners, this is often their first exposure to hash tables without even being told they're looking at a hash table to do this expression. Now, sometimes these get really ugly when you have lots of properties. So it's convenient to know that you can actually just put this hash table in its own variable, and then you can reference it, reference it on the line to get that same effect. And this greatly cleans up your code if you're one to use select object a lot with those expressions. So this is the exact same thing. And I like how I can just read it straight on the page versus something here that might scroll, especially if we had three or four of these custom expressions. And then splatting. This is, this is the uh, most awesome feature to learn if you didn't know about it before. Okay, so, so some functions have lots of parameters. All right, if I, like, if I look at this guy, I've got a name, a start range, an end range, a subnet, and it just keeps on going, like all these parameters, and it literally scrolls off the side of my page. And there's, an, there's a way we can use a hash table to shorten the syntax. Like if we place all those parameters into a hash table first, so every one of those parameters is in here, and then my you know, inline expressions jump out are easier to read and see. And then I can use the the at sign instead of the dollar sign when calling the hash table. And it maps every one of those properties to this function and passes them in for me. So again, talking about like writing clean code, this is one of those most simple, this is probably one of the simplest things you can do to clean up your code if you have really long functions. Like my, my rule of thumb is if I'm doing more than two, um, I tend to use that, that splatting technique. And then before I go on, there are some plugins. I'm trying to go off script a little bit here, but there's a plugin for Visual Studio, like the editor services, that gives you some options here. So I should be able to highlight this. Control, bring up the special PowerShell commands, and gives me a convert to splat expression. And fingers crossed, it basically, on the fly, took all those parameters and built a hash table that is splattable to it. Uh, you format that guy so they're in a line. So this, so this will do this, the, the splatting for me if I'm refactoring code that's gotten a little bit too crazy. Now I'm going to undo this to keep my demo clean. Um, and then a clever trick I use quite a bit is when I need like to deal with optional parameters, right? So sometimes I have functions that sometimes they take a credential if I pass a credential, or I'm just calling some other function and I have optional parameters that I want to split in or not. So here I might create like 
the sim parameters, it has a class name and a computer name. And if my toolkit script provides a credential, I can add the credential to this hash table. Because then when I splat it, it would actually have the class name, the computer name, and the credential. But if I decided not to provide the credential, it wouldn't create it on here. And um, my, 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 my splat hash table will be very clean. Quite often, I see people do like a switch statement where they have, if I have the credential, I'll call this function one way. If I don't have the credential, I call it a different way. Like they're repeating the call to the function instead of just adjusting the parameters and then calling the function once. Um, so changing gears slightly, here's another clever trick is you can actually add hash tables uh, in, using this syntax. So my person, if we remember, um, just has like the name and age from before. And if I do plus equals, I'm adding the second hash table to the first one. And if I check the value, um, it now has a zip code in this, in, in this spot. The one gotcha here though is you can't have any colliding names. So it's more of a merge, if you will, versus an add. So if I run this a second time, I get the error that the key has already been added and um, it, it, it just chokes really hard here. Then, okay, then nested hash tables. So as your hash tables and are getting more complicated, say I create a normal person, get back to my base example here, and I can add a location, hash table in this location property, give the city property Irvine, and then the state's California. If I want to look at that, um, person, let me just think I said, convert to, to JSON. Well, so here I can see the structure of it. So now I've got a property that has a nested hash table in here. Um, anytime I'm looking at something with hierarchy, it's nested. I really love convert to JSON. Like it's my go-to function to see what a rich object looks like. Um, so this is the hard way to do it. We can actually do the same thing in line, just specifying the nested hash table um, right here. So now I've built the same thing I saw below, or we did above, all at once. And then we can dot property into individual individual values just by referencing the parent hash, the object, the parent hash table, or the inner hash table, and then the property of it. So this gave me Irvine, because that's the city off that location on that person. More nesting. So we can actually take our objects and add them into a more, uh, another hash table using the name as the key. So this here is where I talk about having, I talk about having hash tables where your key give you a value. And this example is where my value is going to be another hash table. So in this case, I'm kind of treating them like objects. And if I look at uh, people, Kevin, I get out just his values, or I need to get Alex, um, I get his specific values. There's a different way to kind of stack and, and, and manipulate these things. And then you can mix and match the way you access these, right? Like you can treat them as object properties, or you can treat them as these hash table indexes. Um, I suppose my rule of thumb, like when performance doesn't matter, like when I'm treating it, I, I probably would use this quite a bit because I feel like this, the, the, the name is like a key to get my object. And then I'm treating my inner one more like an object than a hash table. 
and I'll pretend like he's an object here. But if performance matters, this is always faster. If you're using the native accessors to deploy your key value pairs out, um, it's quite a bit faster than trying to dot property everything, everything for the uh, object. And then walking the list, pretty much like before, right? We have our, we grab our keys and walk to the name property. And here I'm, I'm basically going to pull the value out just so that my my one line of syntax is easier here. But we basically can walk the list of of hash tables and pull out these sub properties. Uh, taking a look at nested hash tables, and here's where I mentioned we can use our convert to JSON to see structure, to see what these things look like. Um, and then and you do the same thing for arrays of hash table. So here we use an array instead of a parent hash table, and here we're nesting them to have multiple, uh, an, uh, an array of hash tables. So if we look at this guy, you know, if you're familiar with JSON, this here says this is an array, and here's our, our inner object. Um, sorting arrays of hash tables. So if I do, like, I think I should be able to sort on name, but because it's a hash table, um, it's not grabbing the properties like you think they are. You actually need to use the it's the short expression syntax. Say on my object, use the property dot name, because while this is while this syntax here pretends pretends like it's an object, that doesn't actually work in all cases of PowerShell. So while you would think that you should be able to do the the syntax of sort on name, it's not going to actually evaluate the key name. It's going to look for a property, an actual property, and give you null, and won't sort at all. So if you need to sort an array, you've got to do the expression and pull out the specific key that you want to sort. And then if you actually want to create objects, this is my probably my favorite way ideal way to create an object is actually start with a hash table and use the PS custom object type accelerator. So the first thing you'll notice right away when, when I use an object instead of a uh, hash table is that my values are my, 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 my keys now become like more like a table, these properties of an object versus key value pairs. And there's times, especially in like reporting and things, that you actually would prefer that, that tabular structure. Um, this is a very, very quick way to create that. We can also do it backwards where we create the hash table first and then cast it to a PS custom object. So you don't have to start with a custom object um, out of the gate if that makes your code and logic easier especially if you might be adding properties to your object. Um, I try to keep, if I'm doing that, I try to keep my stuff as a hash table tor as long as I can, and maybe at the end of my function, cast it as an object and then return it. That way you can delete and remove so much faster than you could working with proper objects. And then just like before, um, we can take our array of, of people, for each object, we can cast it to a PS custom object, and then you can sort it on name. Like that's another way to get your list sorted the way you want is get the things into objects so that the properties are truly properties, and now they'll sort by the name. So they ran this guy without that. We'll see that Kevin was first, but with the sort, um, it's now grabbing the right one. And then the same thing goes for like saving to a CSV. I don't know if you've ever tried to save a hash table to a CSV, but it's a big mess of key value pairs. So you can do the same trick where you do for each object, convert it to an object and export to a path, which you can then 
um, uh, you get that same tabular format as, as looking at before. If we ever need to save a hash table, um, my preferred way of getting it to disk is literally convert it to JSON and then set the content. So I'd save it to disk. Uh, the gotcha is, but and then they get it back out. Um, you can run this convert from JSON once you get the content, but he he lies to us. Like he he converts it from JSON, but he gives us a PS custom object instead of a hash table. So that's a gotcha to be aware of if you're actually wanting to save a hash table and get that same hash table back to do more with it. Uh, but there's some PowerShell 5. There's some serializers out there. Um, I'm, there's a second one I need to add to this list, which is the NewtonSoft, the .NET object that we could use as well as this ugly piece of code. But if you're on PowerShell 6, they actually added a as hash table flag to the convert from JSON. So if you update to like six or six out one or a random side by side, um, no life is getting easier in the future to where you can actually save it as a JSON and and get your hash table back out of there. If you another option is if you're not doing it programmatically but actually writing a file, like I have in my project, this data person ps one which is pure PowerShell. I mean, basically, it's, it, it's a hash table saved, right? And that's what PSD1s tend to be, is hash tables. I can uh, get the content. Um, I'm doing something fancy with script blocks here, but basically, I can get the content and I can execute the script block to get a hash table back out. So let me see if this guy runs for me. And now, if I look at my hash table, I have all those values. So the reason why, and then I added, so this other stuff I skipped over is I'm creating a script block, and then I'm checking the restricted language. This is more one of those best practices that because these are null, I'm not allowing any commands or any variables, nobody can slip PowerShell into my PSD1 that can be executed in my scripts. So that's why I'm going through this extra overhead. Like this works fine without running that, but uh, I'd highly recommend verifying your script before you just blindly executing them when you think they could be, you know, generic data. I mean, if you have full control over the pipeline, that's one thing. But if you're getting data files from other people or through other processes, checking the language is is a, I said just a best practice. And then. A little bit of magic is there is this special type, this special attribute. It's a long one. I think he's not meant to be documented or used, but he does this magic trick where you attach him to a variable. I, this guy's on multiple lines just so that you can read him. But if I actually run, add that attribute to this variable and I run that, he's actually gonna do the conversion for me to a hash table. So he makes this guy take either a hash table or a file path. And if it's a file path, he converts it to a hash table automatically. Um, if you're a fan of the using syntax in your functions, we can shorten this slightly to say, right, using uh, namespace um, I think it's using. Uh, but he needs to be at the top of your file. So uh, he's just a clever hack that was put in place for desired state configuration. Um, and that's one place I've ever seen it used. So continuing on with other oddities, you know, this is a reminder that, that the keys are just strings. So if you need spaces in them, you can put your, you know, put single quotes around the value. Uh, so if I run this one here, I can then use the 
full name here to access it. And I can still do my dot and a string, which is this, this is like a little known feature hack, if you will, is you can actually put your quotes around your property names if they have spaces and access them. And you can even go further and use a variable there. Well, I don't like the syntax in that, um, I don't know, it's, it's hard to know exactly what's happening here. It's easy to mistake in this for something else. But just know that this works. You can put any value in a variable. You can do person dot in that variable, and you'll get that value out. Now with note, so uh, note, uh, make note, though, that you can't do dot properties. I mean, if you do something like this, location.city, it's only for the key named location.city and not do location as one property and city as the second that I used from a previous example. So these are two separate key names, where this here would be one key name, and you wouldn't find what you're looking for. Um, path by reference and shallow copies. OK, so this is one of those gotchas that's kind of hard to track on sometimes. But when you have like normal variables and you assign them to each other, value types, you get a copy of the object. Right. So if I run these two values, you know, I, I assign them to be the same thing. So copy has the value of original, and my output below shows that. So if I change the value of copy, um, the variable original was untouched. He should still have the original value because they're actually two different objects, value types are. Right. So the original is the original value, and the copy has the copy value. When it comes to reference types, the rules are a little bit different. So a hash table, when I take the original and send me the copy, um, I'm actually assigning a reference to this object, whatever he is. So right now, these have the same value, original and original. But here, if I make them, if I go through the process of changing the name and the copy, I'm actually going to be, because these are the same hash table, they reference the same hash table, we should see it update both of them. The original and the copy are now seeing the copy. So that's one of those gotchas that can um, lead to weird bugs. Uh, and I, just, I want to put that there as, as an awareness. If you're passing hash tables around, you make changes in them. Anybody that's referencing that hash table will see the changes. Um, and then that's where we're talking about shallow copies, where we can do like a, a copy of an object at a single level. So here we get our same example. We get our, and we create our copy, but we're going to clone it this time. We're going to make copies of all the value types so that they start out the same, but then when we update the one value on the copy, only the copy gets changed. And the original is untouched because we made a clone of it. Um, but that only goes so far. And I use the keyword shallow intentionally because it doesn't go beyond the first level. So if I do the same example again with a more complex object, you know, we'll get a clone of the person, but because the person is a reference type, as we update the name of the copy, um, we're going to get these values to diverge or, or be the same because the copy person and the original person are the same. Um, there's an endless thread you can go on and try to find the best way to copy hash tables. Um, sometimes you can kind of serialize them and pull them back out. But it's more of a gotcha to be aware of is that when you're changing and editing hash tables, um, be aware that, that you might not be changing, you might be changing more than you expect. All right, so let's jump into my next wave here. Um, oh yeah, so here is 
Another great feature that is very commonly overlooked. Um, so if you knew about splatting and that didn't impress you, uh, this is another one that a lot of people just don't realize is that so if I do get child item here, I have you know, a handful of files. If I want to get those into a hash table, I can actually use group object as hash table on a property to give me this same set of data where I can use the name of the file to access, uh, and the value is the object itself. So if I do the part1.ps1, I get that file out. And then I can actually do the properties on it. So if I just want the full name off that file, um, I can grab it. Now, uh, uh, there is one gotcha you though, like some properties, for whatever reason, come back as objects that are hard to reference. And that's why they added this as string so that um, it just a good rule of thumb is if you're trying to access something that you turned into a hash table from group object that uses a very unique property, like a script property for the, the underlying value, the as string will make it work again. It's kind of a weird nuance, but if I do, let me see if I can recreate it here. Let me not do the as string first. If I run this value, for whatever reason, that's not at getting the, uh, the, the, the property out of there because it's doing reference stuff. But if I do the add string, um, I can actually get that file and pull it out. So just one of those gotchas, be aware of. Use add string if you're using this. Special hash tables, PS bound parameters. This is a special function uh, parameter that if you have a function uh, that the PS bound parameters gives you a hash table of all the parameters that were bound when the function was called or were used. And that's in a very important caveat. So if I specify, let me load this function into memory here. And if I run this, this first whatever, I'll say the first has a value of 90210 and it was passed in that value. Now, if you didn't notice, I have a default value here, right? So if I run it without this parameter, I'll get the default value, um, but I can tell no value was provided to my function by taking a closer look at this, this PS bound parameter. So basically because um, I did not specify first, as a parameter, I got null and he fell through. So that's just one of those things to be aware of is if you want to be able to detect if somebody passed a parameter or not, you can use PS bound parameters to, to, uh, to deduce that. Um, the next clever thing is you, you can combine the PS bound parameters with the idea of splatting to where here we can use a proxy function that takes two parameters. And then, yeah, let's just do this. Let me load this guy. Because um, PSBound parameters is a hash table, we can splat it to this base function. So sometimes you're building some functions that have, that need like all the parameters, will support many of the parameters as the second function that you're calling. This is a quick way to say, you know what, just whatever I get, let's pass it on to the, this, this child function, or give you a chance to, make some small changes um, to the parameters um, before you pass it and go on. So if I run this guy now, um, it's gonna run on my local box and say, here's my, here's my BIOS information. And normally if you'd specify a computer name that was null, this, 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 this one here would be really mad at you. But since I passed in no computer name, it didn't bind the computer name. Only it only bound the class to that function. Then the next magic hash table is PS default parameter values. I use this guy to 
I put this in my profile so that some common functions that I'm always specifying the same value to, like if I only had one um, uh, vCenter server for my environment, and I got tired of specifying that all the time, I can actually just say my vCenter server is this value, and it will default for me that value every time I call that function. Um, then another example is format table auto size true. Like if I want to always call that, or say my output encoding, if I always want this file to use UTF-8 instead of whatever it was using, um, putting this in my profile, those values will always be set that way. Now there are wildcard support with this as well. So if I want to say, you want know, to just give me verbose on every every commandlet, I can say get dash star. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, I was jumping again. Uh, get dash verbose and set everything to true. Or I can do the flip side where I say, you know what? Everything that requires a credential, I'm going to specify it with whatever I provide here. So if you're doing stuff that's like cross domain or you're targeting lots of like local workstations, you want to put like a local admin credential for your session, you can just set a default credential to be whatever value you specify and all of your actions will default that in. Um, here's a scenario where for, let's say all the AD commandlets, I'm working on a lab system that's in a different domain. I could do star dash AD star and the server name and server. And then lab.domain is my fake domain that would be used every time I call an AD commandlet. So really handy, especially when um, you're working on different things. And then regex matches. This is another one of my favorite um, automatic variables that uh, is easy to overlook. So when you're using regex or the match, it's a regex match. I have this string and I want to match um, a sub expression. I'll, I'll just match it. So I got a full string and I have a sub string in here as a very hacky way to grab this value. So if I grab this and it hit a fades, that I got true because it matched. The first item, or zero actually, is the full string down here, full string. And the first sub expression is that social security number. Then I like to take it the next step and use named matches. So I got the same string to start with, Using this 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 name this named match syntax question mark and this SSN when I run the match this time my automatic hashed variable here gives me a property of SSN that lets me actually access that object as if it was an object. So this is my this is my my favorite things to show people too is named matches for regex to this automatic matches variable. Like it's this guy that creates this variable. So every time he does a match, he'll recreate this. Um, so it's important to know when you're doing like loops or on the pipeline that every match check will change this. So if I do a for each match on a string through a loop at the end, the matches will be like the last thing that got matched. Um, but here's some calling them right after each other. You, that's where we see the value. And then here's one with two named matches where I add the name and the social security number. So let me load this one, load this one. And now I'm going to say property.name, property.ssn. I love this syntax because it keeps my code really clean. You know, I, I, I try to avoid magic numbers because there's just that much more of a disconnect between what this is asking for and what that means, right? So if somebody's looking at my code, um, they're more likely to make a connection that these two things are related to each other and they almost help like self-document um, everything. And then uh, I need to touch base on hash map. So, uh, so let me get some data here. 
and get a hash table. What's my data look like? My data's got just a handful of values. And th there's a common pattern where, let's see. OK, so what I'm going to do is you know, I've, I've got this common pattern where I use a hash table just as a way to see if something exists or not. Right. So here's a scenario where I create a hash table that's empty. I'm going to walk each data item, and I'm going to just basically put a value inside this hash table that says, I exist. So my key value pair is the key is the number, and the value is true. So if, I ever see, if you ever see yourself doing this, and your sole purpose is to then walk a full list of numbers, and just to do this contains to see does my hash table contain a number where you don't actually care about the value at all. Like I just care that the number is in the list and not that it has a value. You can use a hash set from the dot net from from dot net to say this list will give me whatever. This is basically just the keys. If I do that same trick here, I just add the key or the va value in this case because they're basically um, kind of one and the same. And then I can still do this. Does my set contain this number? So um, it's just one of those syntactic, syntactic triggers where you can basically just have the, the hash table of the keys and not care one bit about the values. And this will allow you to do that. And then I think I'm kind of almost at my end of time here. So I want to show one last example here with. Uh, over here. Let me generate some data real quick. I want to touch on joining objects. And I think. Uh, do I not have this module? Install. Module scope uh, current user so I, I was generating some random data here. Apparently I don't have this module installed. Well I guess I can't show that anymore. Darn it. Um name it, but that's what it is. Sorry, right, going on a tangent here. Name it. Uh, okay. So this is a great module. Name it lets you do uh, random information pretty easily. So while this installs, I'm going to use it to generate random people names and random social security numbers, or or phone numbers, I guess in this case. So I want five objects and. All right. So what this gives me is let's say I had two CSVs. I'm going to pretend here, where one of them just has. Oh, I ran that too fast. Uh, F8. One of them just has the server information, like this server owns this person. And the second one is uh, determining if my stuff is secure or when they were last updated. And the scenario is um, you see this pattern where you got to walk one to match against the second one to build a big, more robust object. So let's run this real quick. And we do get that object, right? I was able to join them. So I have the owners with the status, secure or unsecured. But what I want to point out is that this operation here is walking this whole list every time you walk this other list. Right, so I get, that actually gets really expensive really quick. So if I bounce that up to say, uh, let's go 50, it might be noticeable. So I'm going to run this new set of data here. And what I'm going to do instead, so OK, so the first example is this. Right? I'm doing a for each and a for each. So I want to count how many operations that generates on 
uh, executing this. So if I run this whole thing, we can just see the wasted operations fly by and how many times a 50 by 50 walked past, um, did a comparison they didn't need to do, right? So here's that for each server, for each patch info, do a comparison. You know, we did 2,500 extra comparisons. What we can do is use a hash table to create a lookup table on the fly. So in this case, I take my server patches, make it a hash table, and now when I run this, I'm walking one object once, and I'm doing a lookup once into this hash table. This is a very, very fast operation because it's not walking every single item. You're asking for one thing, and it knows really fast how to get that back to you. So let's get a measurement on this. This guy says, uh, oh, I need data first. And then let's run my example. Oh, no. I've got something broken in that example. Select outputs. Do I not need this? Ah, uh, that's just me copying and pasting too much. I'll get to that in a second. Okay, measure command. That's what I was wanting to do. So here we're going to do the, the, the for each loop with a measure command. Any random, what, six, six milliseconds? Let me run a couple times here just to get like an average. All right, between 30 and 56. If we use our hash table, do the same thing with lookup, and run this guy, we're getting like 12, 11. So it's an order of a magnitude faster to just create your lookup table and then walk the list once and pull each value out. Uh, so, and then I mentioned this before, and so the other detail in performance is, I mentioned before, was that the way you access properties, right, if I do this dot property versus the index reference, we should see a race between two different values. And while the difference isn't big, there is a noticeable difference. So this guy ran, what, 700 milliseconds slower than the one where I was just accessing the properties directly. And you can do the same thing, get a numerator, but there's no measurable difference. So I'm just going to skip over that since we're kind of going along on time. And the last thing I want to mention before I wrap it up is that if you are working a lot with C-sharp libraries or interoperability, um, I tend to treat my objects as I dictionary instead of saying hash table here. Um, and I, I find just some compatibility works a lot smoother when I'm working with I dictionaries back and forth between C sharp versus just PowerShell's hash table. So I think I'm actually wrapped up my shows here. I know a little bit long. I suppose I'll open up for questions if anybody has any feedback or anything they want to take a look at. Uh, so I haven't seen any questions show up in the chat. I have a sneaking feeling that maybe I'm not viewing the chat properly, but do we have any questions um, from the live audience? Yeah, the demos are going to end up, I, I believe they're going to be in your uh, GitHub repository. Is that right? Uh, uh, yes, and they already are. I dropped the links into the YouTube chat window, but my GitHub, I have all my presentations are always on GitHub. I like that because one, people can pull them whenever they want, but there's also this handy download zip button. So I almost like it specifically so if they want a zip file, they can click on that link and they get their own copy of the files. If you're familiar with Git, you can clone it and take a look at these demos themselves. Right, and I'll be doing just a tiny bit of editing on the video, and when I do that, I'll add the links to the GitHub and links to anything else that we need um, to the uh, description of the video. Uh, so you'll be able to go there and click on it. You won't have to worry about, you know, 
uh, typing typing that in. Uh, Kevin, I, I see that you are looking at a different view of the chat than I am. If you see questions in the chat um, using your view, please do feel free to, to kind of pick those up and, and, and answer those. No, I think uh, I don't see any questions in my in my feed, so we're looking good there. And and like I said, and then I know I went through a lot of I know I went through stuff really fast. And it's that's kind of the neat in, in a way. There's so much to cover in this talk that I do try to have something for everybody. And the one value of this format is I think no matter where you're at in PowerShell, your your skill level with hash tables is that you probably picked up something this time around, and that. If you come back to this and watch this video again in say three months or read that blog post again every so often, you will find new value in there because you just didn't realize you needed it before. So I know I threw a lot at a lot of people. I'm hoping that everybody walked away with one or two things today that is of value to them and that they return later and learn something new the next time they see the material which is a fresh set of eyes. Yeah, the question is, are, are there any tricks maybe for DSC um, that, yeah, maybe processing DSC scripts that you can um, So, uh, yeah, so DSC, I, I'm at, we could probably do a whole topic, several sessions on DSC itself. Um, uh, let me see if I have any of my other... Uh, so DSC, right? That so the config data. I don't know if you've done custom configs. Um, do I have it on? I do. CD config code. Um, I'm just gonna do a little preview. Uh, I'm looking for so config data, right? There's ways you can specify the uh, like. A variable for, I'm gonna get my bearings on this one. So here's a scenario where you have a, a configuration, right? That wants, I'm specifying a node name of all nodes, and it's actually doing some magic where I pass in like this hash table, and it will walk the config for every node name that I have. Now there's a ton of information on config data, and these can get really complex really fast um, with information. But I think um, there is a lot of value in knowing hash tables in this context of configuration data. I, I probably, so I do have another talk I give like, um, I, I, I do have a talk I give in my local group where I literally talk just about config data and the many different ways you can leverage it and abuse it. Um, where I'm doing in my config data, like here's a, let's see, where's a good preview? Does this sit here? Well, I got so, so many examples in here. I had one in mind specifically I wanted to grab. Where, so here's one where I'm using the traditional all nodes, and this guy's getting big, this is like the middle of the demo. If I collapse him, I'm adding like in layers of environments and I got layers of hardware. And inside my script, I do something magic where I ask for, oh, somewhere. There, I add a function that takes my config data and I'm asking for a property and it knows to look at the environments first. And then, or the hardware first, and then the environment, and then the base value. So I'm kind of doing some like layering stuff where it says, find me this install root, no matter where it is in that giant config data, so that I gotta have the ability to configure these things at a hardware level versus an environment level, like it might be passwords or hardware information. So that's like, I suppose, one of the more advanced, clever things I've done with configuration data and hash tables. But since this is the data that drives the configuration and you have just properties all over the place that get pulled from your config data, um, I suppose that's my prime example. Yeah, and, and config data is definitely one of those things that makes a lot more sense once you understand it in the context of uh, 
you know, hash table syntax. To, to, to me, it's like one of those things where you're, you're building a module and you have, you have a PSM1 and a PSD1. The PSD1 file is pretty confusing until you make the connection like, oh, this is just, this is just PowerShell, this is just hash table syntax. And it's a lot like that with the config data variables. Absolutely. Like I said, there's, it's easy to get lost in this until it really, until it really clicks for you. And I know this is probably the most confusing way for me to show you anything about it. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have to have you back for a talk about that, right? Yeah. So I suppose other talks I could do is um, config data and some of the comp. So I, I don't use config data at Lone Depot, but in my previous employer, the configs I'm staring at right now are modeled after an implementation of DSC I did for them. So it got, it gets complex pretty quick, but um, I use config data very heavily for that environment. I also have a talk on just the many ways to do custom stuff with DSC, where I, I walk through uh, script resources, uh, custom script resources, composite resources, and then class-based resources, kind of get that gamut of ways you could do something if the resources don't exist. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, so I don't think we have any more questions uh, in person, unless we have any more questions from the online audience. I, I think we'll call it a stream. How does that sound to you? I think, that, I think that sounds good to me. So yeah, thank you guys for having me out. I, I appreciate getting the chance to talk and share you know, more tips and tricks with you guys. Um, I appreciate any feedback. And if there's any other topics you'd want to hear, um, yeah, feel free to ping me and we can probably, I could probably settle something else in the future. Yeah, and feel free to leave us uh, feedback in the comments on the, on the video. If you have questions that you think of uh, later, leave a comment on the video and uh, you know, we'll see if we can get you some answers. Um, thanks for coming, and uh, we'll take care of some of the in-person uh, business here, and uh, have a good night, everybody. <laughs>